All right, let's kick this thing off. It still does say I'm in a practice. Oh, it went over. Yep. Well, hi there. I, I'm real excited we're getting this kicked off. We're kicking off a little early. If you catch us on Facebook, you'll see that real quick. This is Life's Co-Pilot. I'm Jim Morgan. You know, Cheryl um, Molder. Do you say, Molder Molnar. Molnar. It's Cheryl. Okay. Yeah, okay. It's so, um, <laughs> so we are uh, going to be talking today about a topic that personally, until I got into the senior uh, services industry through Caring Transitions, I thought I knew what it was, okay? I thought it was basically a morphine drip the last few days of somebody's life, and that's, you know, my dad's experience with it was the uh, doctor ordered uh, hospice, and the lady showed up five minutes after dad died, and she did the paperwork. So, I, you know, I think that a lot of people have a great deal of misunderstanding about this, and it could have been a wonderful thing to have known you know, two years before that, that you know, dad could have benefited from and mom would have benefited from the services. So Cheryl, you are yes. with uh, uh, Guardian Angel Hospice. I am. And I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Tell us yes. about who you are. Tell us about who Guardian Angel is. Okay. And then let's, let's have a conversation. Yes, I'm Cheryl Molnar. Um, I work for and honored to work with and for Guardian Angel Hospice. Um we are the oldest privately owned company in the area. There's like 110 hospice companies, I believe. Um, we just hit a while, a little while back, 21 years. Um, our CEO and one of our founding mothers, uh, Leslie Beaver, uh, as well as uh, Dorothy DeWitt, they come in to the office. They're still actively working. We will not be sold out. We have been asked many times by the bigger companies to, um, to buy us and very honored that we are not considering that at all um, because they really feel the founding mothers and the team and leadership and owners feel like um, if we did that, we, we will lose the guardian angel hospice way. And, and that is of integrity and um, doing things for the right reasons. Um, you know, even with our communities. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, but, um, just honored to be here. And I really appreciate the invite. And well, thank you. Well, I'm glad you're here again. This is a topic that I think that most people greatly misunderstand. They have a, yeah. there's a perception out there, what hospice is, but it's so much more than that. Okay. And now tell me, how did you get, what got you in, into this, uh, industry? Well, um, actually, I'm a degree school teacher, um, owned a Montessori preschool daycare for 20 years. And then my mom got sick, um, originally from Chicago area. And I knew nothing about hospice. I'm the oldest of four. And my dad had passed away at 48, which was the beginning of my caregiver experience with my dad. I was 20 and he was 48. And um, mom was having a hard time. It was an aggressive form of lung cancer, non-smokers, um, due to be stationed in the army back in Korea years back. Um, and so I had to learn a lot in a short amount of time. And I did and never regret the time with my dad. It was, is absolutely precious time with him. Um, and then years later, my mom got diagnosed with her second bout of, uh, lung cancer and an autoimmune disorder called scleroderma. And she was gone from diagnosis four months. Um, so the hospice company um, came in and they supported my siblings and I. And I mean, just in so many ways, it's, it's such an emotional trying time, you know, when you're, um, when you have somebody that you love it is really your everything and you're just, you just feel so helpless. And And the thing is, when I go in and talk to my patients, our patients and families, I will, I bowed to myself and I've done a pretty good job with that, that I will never forget what it was like to feel like a deer in headlights, um, emotionally, physically, spiritually, mentally, um, this hospice nurse in Chicago and team came in, they said, we're going to take care of your mom's pain, her anxiety with all of this, manage a lot of different things. And we just want you to be a daughter for her last two weeks. And it was like, 
all the air kind of came out and I, I really did feel supported. And, um, so did my siblings and, um, it was such a beautiful thing. Um, unfortunately we only had mom for about two weeks after, after that, but, um, it was a God calling. So I, literally a God calling. So I got into it by selling non, non-medical home care, senior sitter service on the South side for a company called right at home. Uh, my goal was hospice always. And I got my first gig about a year after I did non-medical, um, worked for another company and really enjoyed that. Um, and then found my way to guardian angel hospice and um, been with the company now for seven and a half years total, which I know is um, out there. That's a, that's a long time in healthcare. But I honestly believe in what we do. I believe in our care. I believe in um, how our clinical manager handles things. Um, And I also believe in choice. I believe that there's other companies out there. That's a Medicare law to give choice. Um, And we, as Guardian Angel Hospice, do believe in, in following those rules. So lots of different things that make us stand out. And I can, I can share with that now, or we can, we can talk about well, Go ahead. You, I mean, you can, uh, and then we're going to really kind of get into the, the whole idea of hospice and how it really works and sure. what it is and what it isn't, you know, so. Yeah. Um, well, we stand out because, you know, we have long livers within our company organization. We've been around for 21 straight years, helping the communities. People know us. Um, We are out there. They've heard of us. They've had friends and family that have used us. Um, Our communication piece is amazing. We meet everybody where they're at. Um, We've had hospice patients in assisted livings, nursing homes, skilled facilities, um, hospitals, private homes. We've done hospice in a tent. We've done hospice in um, a homeless shelter. Wherever somebody calls home, Um, very proud of that. Um, Our communication piece is very important, especially with um, the families and like the facilities that we um, are able to help with the team. We're we're taught that we are guests in those buildings and we um, follow suit with that and take that serious. Um, We have an aromatherapy program like no other. we actually have a lab in Kokomo. Uh, these oils are care planned. It has a doctor's order attached. Um, Ocean is our aromatherapist. She's clinical. Um, she's put in a lot of hours to get this certification. And um, we have seen such huge differences with our patients that have, for instance, pancreatic cancer is a very difficult one to titrate the meds with. Um, and get everything so that there's really feeling some relief. And we've had several patients that have had, we're having a really hard time kind of getting past that, uh, giving them some peace to help with the pain. And we add the oils, the essential oils, these strong oils um, that we have put a lot of research in to build this up, this program up. And we've seen such a difference in um, helping maintain um and and with their pain um we have an oil for pain one for anxiety one for sleep one for nausea and one for constipation um that really works um the other side of our aromatherapy program is angel touch which is we put um, oils in lotions they've been put together very thin so they do not like tear the skin um and our aides are um performing the therapeutic touch, the angel touch, uh, after baths. We can also put a little bit of oil in the lotion, uh, actual lotions, uh, showers and baths, bed baths. Um, and you know, our patients really look forward to this, especially at, um, some of the skilled facilities where maybe families are out of town and they're not getting that, um, that touch, that warm touch, touch deprivation is a real thing. And it is so imperative that we um, we're able to do that with our patients during their time of need. It's something they, like I said, look forward to. And it's, it's such a loving thing that we can provide. Um, 
We also have a music coordinator named Adam, who is amazing. He sings and plays the guitar for our patients. So we can add extra time every week with our patients um, mm -hmm. with him. And then we have a volunteer program. We have seven volunteers locally um, that can also come in and provide extra hours, um, especially with the residents or patients that um, don't have a lot of family support. We can tack on hours of that. And we don't just say we have these things. We actually make sure that we put these in place after every informational that we do with the patient and family so that they're getting that extra care. Everything is customized, um, which is important because every patient's needs and family's needs are so dynamic and special and important to them. So um, I really feel like we do a great job with our organization, keeping that in mind. Um, some of our patients need help with showers two days a week with our aid. Sometimes it's more. And again, as long as it's in the care plan, we follow that in what the patients and families needs are and sometimes the facilities. So this can be done obviously at home. It can be done at a facility. It can be done, you know, what have you. How does someone, you know, I guess with you guys, but but gen in general, how does someone get hooked up with a hospice? Is it something that they have to wait for their doctor for? Is it something that, you know, they get, you know, a prescription for? Or like, right. Or, or right. How, how does, how does this come about? Well, that's a great question. Um, you can actually refer yourself to hospice. A lot of people don't know that. Um, for whatever reasons you've been going through something and you can actually call your doctor and ask them to send um, your information to a organization, a hospice company of your choice. Sometimes the physicians do have suggestions on who they use, but ultimately it is your choice. Um, sometimes the physicians will send us um, a referral um, or a social worker at a facility, but um, sometimes we have like, if it's a husband wife situation, and the husband is ill, the wife will call and say, I just think it's time can you get things together? We'd like to, you to come out, at least give us some information. And Jim, we can come out months ahead of time. I really would like to push this idea. The earlier, the better. Um, you know, when you're in a critical situation towards the end, it's everybody is, again, like deer in headlights and exhausted and stressed that's a really tough time for us to come in. We absolutely do what we need to, but um, we love to see our, be able to see our patients way ahead of time early and the families to get to know them. That takes the anxiety, a big portion of the anxiety off because we learn to know what their likes are and their dislikes. And to be honest with you, um, the nurses and the aides are the ones that get really up close and personal with the patients. And so there's that comfort that needs to be built to it. be able to have, um, I would say, the ultimate hospice experience, um, to feel that love, to feel that care, to feel that safety, which is obviously very important when you're going through something significant like a um, illness. So when um, when someone is is contacting you know some of the the perceptions you know that that are i know you know this but it's like the the people think of as hospice they think they're giving up you know it's like they they feel like they're you know they're throwing in the towel it's you know whatever there's not right. and they're uh uh it's kind of one of those things they wait for the very last second to do so they don't really get the benefits that they could have had because they're trying to put off that um what is the can you explain what hospice really is versus what people think it is well, i can tell you what it used to be was um you know what i thought before i knew anything and before my mother got sick was it was it seemed to me at the time it was a big death cloud dark cloud you get on hospice only at the very end when you are you know a couple days out or a week or whatever that is not the case. We have patients that uh, graduate on and off many times. I think the, the patient that's been on with us the longest I heard was eight years. That doesn't happen very often, on and off, on and off. Um, 
we basically move from most of the time our patients seeing the doctors, the physicians getting poked and prodded. And we move the focus on not getting them better, but giving them a better quality of life. We do not take away hope. Hope is still a big component of what we're able to do for our patients and our families. Um, we've had patients and families that we've put together a big birthday party. Um, you know, maybe their birth, the patient's birthday is three months out and we're not sure if they'll be with us. So we, we, we suggest, we plan, um, we facilitated um, renewal of vows. Um, different kinds of wishes through our foundation. Um, we're trying to um, move to the approach of getting the patient to feel better physically with, you know, whatever it is, naturalistic, our aromatherapy program. We have some patients that decide to get on because it's less scary when they know they don't have to start with any meds and stay homeopathic, naturalistic with their approach. Um so all of those things are, you know, really important. Um, do you have any other questions about that? Or? Well, yeah, it's kind of like, you know, I, I had a, I had someone that was in the hospice industry. I was asking them one time, I said, okay, explain to me what hospice is as if I'm, uh, you know, a fourth grader, just kind of, you know, or whatever, you know, just mm -hmm. make, you know, make me a simple answer. Yeah. And um, I thought he did a brilliant job. What he said was, he goes, Doctors are trained and operate in curative care. So they're going to do what they can to cure you. That's and right. If you have something that's not curable, okay, mm -hmm. then they're going to try this and test that and what have you. And it may, you know, it, it's got not going to have a cured result because it's not curable, but right. they are basically maybe torturing you rather than, you know, than making you comfortable. Whereas, when you come into hospice, you're looking at a treating the the symptoms, not the cause. Yes, right. And all of a sudden you feel better. Well, if you feel better, maybe you're sleeping better. If you're sleeping better, maybe you're eating better. If you're eating better, maybe you feel better. And all of a sudden yes. you're doing things you haven't been able to do for a long time. Yes. Spiritually, emotionally, physically, um, mentally. We we work with all of those things um in conjunction as one one big focus. And it's not just, so our company was actually built, um, our original founding mothers got together. They were all hospice nurses and they um, realized back 21 years ago that they were focused more on patients versus the families. And they thought, and this is how we were born, what if we focused on the families, loved them just as much as the patients and educated them which would help, in fact, with the anxiety they feel to be able to help treat, let's say, their loved one at home, where would we be? So we, as an organization, are very focused on that, supporting the family just as much as the patient. We have some hospice patients, to give a clear picture and kind of water this down as you asked, um, that are definitely the what you would see in the movies, in the bed towards the end, right, if we get them on last minute. Um, we have some patients that go to, uh, we pack their bags with meds and supplies with their family and they go to Florida for a week. Um, we have, uh, specifically, there's been a couple patients I can think of that, um, still lightly work out with their buddies at the gym and they meet at Denny's every Wednesday for breakfast. Um, so it's, all over the board. Um, it's not what, again, what it used to look like. You have to have a diagnosis that according to the normal disease process, what the physicians have seen with the statistics that there is a decent chance that you might not be here after six months, right? You've got six months or less. Now, does that always happen? No. Do we get people off sometimes? Because when we bring um, the physical piece with the meds and help with anxiety and depression and pain and the spiritual side, the emotional side, and everybody feels supported, not all the time, but many times our patients do better and they do so well that they do not qualify under Medicare because you do have to qualify under Medicare to get hospice service. 
so on that speaking of so is this an expensive project for people or is this a no. okay so mostly it's covered by medicare um with you know we we check we have an amazing astounding admission team at the Kokomo office. I'm out of the Carmel office. Uh, we do have four locations, one in Lafayette, Logansport. Kokomo is, is our hub where our admissions team is as far as, um, you know, scheduling and admitting and all of that. And then I'm out of the Carmel office. So um, usually there's no cost and we can look at the private insurance as well. Every situation is different, but it's actually an earned benefit that we have all earned. Um, and it includes everything from our care to the supplies to um, the DME and the meds. All of that is included um, from the hospice diagnosis moving forward with the meds. So um, it's it's a beautiful gift. It really we call it the gift of hospice because um, you know our patients and our families, especially if we get them on early enough. Um, many times we try to go to the memorial services, the funerals and things like that after. And the, the families, I mean, it, they become, these patients and their families become our family. Um, and it's, you cannot be doing this job if your heart is a hundred percent and you don't have a, your why. You have to have a why. And Jim, I know you've, you've got getting into the business that you have, you've had some whys yourself. Yes, it is. It, I understand that. I was going to say one of the things that I was curious about, what, are, you know, I'm, again, I'm trying to knock down some of the perceptions, the myths that are out there that, that people are, you know, reluctant to call a hospice, you know, uh, community or uh, uh, company. What another one that I hear, and I know that people get concerned about is, well, you know, what happens if I, you know, you know, maybe you're in hospice for cancer, but then you have, uh, you know, a something else that happens, you know, do I go to, can I go to the ER? Can I, you know, whatever, you know, there's right. things that are out there that, that are concerns, you know, that kind of stuff. Well, our goal is to keep our patients out of the hospital. Right. That's a big goal of ours. Um, manage everything that they need to have managed. If you do need to go to the hospital, we always tell our patients and families, you need to sign off of hospice because Medicare looks at it as double dipping. We're trying to get you better in the hospital and we can't do both. Um, another thing to consider is skilled. Um, if you're doing physical therapy, occupational therapy, or speech therapy, um, you need to be off of that for 24 hours before we can get hospice services going for that same reason. Medicare is very strict um, and strong with the regulation. So we just have to wait that 24 hours to be able to put somebody on. Okay. Well, what about that hospital uh, emergency thing? What What is, do they, how do they get that? If they have to go to ER, you may not yeah, get off beforehand. How does that work? We get somebody to either do DocuSign with the family or we okay. figure out somebody comes to the hospital, we'll sign off. Um, and they just continue care there. And then as soon as they're done with their visit at the hospital, we get them right back on. We do have to sign paperwork again because we signed them off. So we have to sign them back on. But for us, that's not a big deal. Um, and even so you if can, we do, you can sign off and sign on with yes, the hospice. Once absolutely. you're on, you're not, it's not, a. Uh, you're not locked in forever. No, nope, no. And in fact, we've had patients that, and that's what I love to, it does take a lot of the anxiety off of the conversation. If you change your mind, once you get on hospice service and you feel like you're doing so well with us and you decide, you know what, I would like to do a little bit of skilled care. I think I'm going to do a little physical therapy and occupational therapy and see, see where I'm at in maybe a couple of weeks. Again, it's one signature to get off and it is no problem to get back on, reorder, um, you know, the supplies and the equipment and all of that. That's our job. We love it. We're honored. Everyone on our team has been handpicked. Um, and they are very strict on who they choose um, to have to be a employee of Guardian Angel Hospice, because it's very important, again, to our founding mother, Leslie Weaver, as well as our owners and our clinical heads that we are doing this all in this for uh, all the right reasons. 
So um, how long how long does it usually take to get someone on to hospice if somebody is, you know, maybe they're trying to hold yourself or maybe the doctor yeah. suggests it or what have you? Well, from the time of the assessment, we need to get all the paperwork either from the social worker's office or the physician's office, which is just faxed. And our admission team handles all of that out of Kokomo um, to set the assessment up with our dedicated um, admission team of nurses that we have separate to do just those. Um, we usually can get somebody admitted within 24 hours. Sometimes it might take just a day and a half because whatever else is going on, but we do admit 24, seven, seven days a week. And most of the time we are able to get to hit that under 24 hour mark. If, especially if it's a critical situation, we move very quickly. Now you were talking about all these different people that do all these different things within the, the scope of the services. How does that work in a family's house? I mean, do they have like scheduled times that people yes. are coming in? How does that, how does all that play out? That's a great question. We have a lead case manager that handles the rest of the team. You know, she's an RN, he or she's an RN. And then we have our LPNs and we have our aides and social workers and chaplains, sometimes volunteer music and the aromatherapy program. Um, and they coordinate with the family the best that they can. We never over promise and under deliver. So we will let the family know that if we have a patient that passes or a critical situation trying to manage pain. Um, we may have to change up the schedule a little bit for that reason, but we really try very hard to meet the needs of the hours of when the family can expect us. Um, and that also helps with the anxiety piece, right? Because you've got people coming in and out. Um, so we do ask what, what are good times that would work for them. And we do try to adhere to that as, the best that we can do they have um say somebody so they said something's going on that becomes um the family or whatever they're just they're, they're highly concerned about something going on that but it's not during a scheduled hour do they call how, do, how does that work we have a 1-800 number that we ask everybody to call through um and it has a live triage nurse answering, again, seven days a week, 24-7. So I advise all my patients and families that call the 1-800 number. Do not feel like you're bothering us. This is what we love to do. I don't care if it's 2 o'clock in the morning or 5 o'clock in the evening. If you have a question or you feel like somebody is running late, you're wondering where they're at or... Um, you're in pain or something else is going on short of supplies, just call that number and we triage that and get somebody out there or minimally at the beginning, um, make a quick phone call um, and figure out what's going on. More than likely it's, you know, the case manager, but if it's something aid related or something like that, they will call. Okay. So tell me, um, someone calls your office how does the process, what's it going to feel like for them or their family, what they're going to go through that process getting all set up? It is honestly, I have worked for three organizations. Again, I've worked for our organization the longest. Um, and I will say that we move fluidly. Um, there is no middle person that gets in the way. Everything goes right to our admissions office. Michelle or Jennifer are in there and they, um, call the if it's the case manager at the hospital or the social worker at the facility um and they or the a physician's office and just get all the information faxed immediately they work on the insurance pieces and they i would say overly communicate with the family like okay this is what we found out this is where we're at you're covered 100 percent now let's schedule the admission nurse to come out it's assessed if we need to um, and you know, can the POA be there to sign the paperwork and we can get that process from the time we call the family, um, you know, within hours to a half a day, most of the time, I won't say that all the time, but most of the time, cause there's always those situations that we have to maybe towards the end of the day, but, um, the whole process with the admission nurse and the paperwork we can get it all done within about usually an hour and a half to two hours at the facility or at the home and wrap it up quick, pretty quickly. And I like to say to my families and patients, 
you do not, you will not look any different once you signed on to hospice. You will look the same in the mirror. There will be no differences other than you get extra support. If you choose not to go on any pain meds, that's your journey. That's my favorite part. I feel blessed to be able to share is that you guys have the steering wheel. We are accessories to support, educate, love, but this is your journey and we honor your journey wherever you are, religiously, spiritually, emotionally, with your pain, family dynamics. We come in and we, we just literally, like I said, when with my mother, there was so much anxiety. We were trying to, I mean, she just had so much going on. I was trying to manage it from Noblesville where I was raising my kids. My little brother was in Chicago, young at the time, just married. He was trying to handle things with my mom. It was very, very tough. But when that hospice team came in and they showed us that they knew what they were doing, they, they told us that they were going to help us. And most importantly, they were going to manage my mother's pain and all of those things that went along with it. I cannot even, I will never forget that hospice nurse ever. And in fact, she, um, I was doing the um, eulogy at the church that my parents were married and we, my mother had the funeral and everything. And uh, somebody dared to be late and uh, the cathedral doors open. And there, there it was, was the hospice nurse that showed up and I gasped. It was that connection that our patients and families, as well as our team have it never goes away. It's, it's just, uh, it's, they give us back way more than we give. I assure you that it's a gift. Well, that's awesome. I just, you know, what would be the something you would like to, I know that you've been doing this for seven years in, in the hospice or whatever. So you've got a pet peeve. I know of trying to figure out how to get people to understand something. So what is it that you'd like to, to tell people if you could grab people by the lapel and, and shake oh, them? Gosh. Yeah. Wow. Well, Jim, I don't want to come in less than peaceful with this. Uh, <laughs> I I actually have been in hospice for 10 years. I've just been okay. with our company for about seven and a half or healthcare for about 10 years. Um, I think just really easier said than done, I know, but the fear, um, the fear, the getting somebody at least to have that conversation earlier will not change your prognosis, good or bad. It It's just information. It's a, it's a peaceful conversation. Um, I do this in honor of my parents every day and I will never push anyone into something this important. I always say to my families and patients, it's, if it feels good here after you meet me and it matches here, then you know you've got the right organization, right? And if it doesn't, then there's somebody else out there. There's other organizations that are also very good and have different things that we might not provide. Um, but I just, that that early education, not to be afraid to at least find out before you're in a way that you're just so terrified and scared and full of anxiety. It just... Being ahead of the game with the planning and the conversation, I think, is the biggest thing I'd like to really push. Maybe strangle people about. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm staying but, you know, so, so, so basically, if someone has a terminal diagnosis, okay, or what yeah. they're they're you made a comment earlier in this conversation that you recommend people getting together before they really have the need. Right. just to have the conversation and that you recommend doing that with like multiple off places to see who has the fit or what's your, what's your thought there? Um, Cause you made that comment about, it, you know, yes, a fit for every. I model. don't even necessarily mean who's fit. I mean, just get the information, the education, you know, know us before you need us. Mm -hmm. Um, just know about hospice, what it is and what it's not. Because like you said, there's the old school way of thinking about hospice, the big dark cloud in the movies, somebody that's actively dying in their bed at that moment. 
it it can be that way, but it's not, there are so many different scenarios and cases that we have um, that oftentimes that isn't the picture that we're seeing. Um, so it's, you know, it's about hope. It's about maintaining um, a quality of life when somebody has been suffering, poked and prodded and chemo and doctor's appointments and the question of what if it's kind of letting go of all of that. And then the quality with your family, um, you know, not being on the meds that make you sick um, and the, the different things that make you feel horrible. You know, we have patients that are on radiation and chemo before before they come on with us and they, their eating has completely stopped. They eat nothing tastes good. They can't, they can't digest and keep it down. And we get them off of that. And we, as experts of pain management and all uh, turn a different direction. And oftentimes we have patients that all of a sudden start to have an appetite that they haven't had in months or close to a year. So, um, you know, just oftentimes our patients do feel a lot better once they come on with us because of that. Would you say that it's possible that a lot of people, you know, the stereotype of, as you said, the old way of thinking of hospice or whatever. Yes. I I would wonder if, you know, because I still understand that most people are on hospice for less than seven days and it's only because that's what people perceive it to be. And it's self-fulfilling. They put themselves into that situation because they don't know that they can come earlier and they can right. get all this support and that they have the ability to have care and support for a long period of time, as opposed to, I think a lot of people wait until it becomes self-fulfilling to the old style. Right. And some people think that they wouldn't qualify and you yeah. don't know until you ask, you don't know until you talk to your doctor, you don't know until you can pick up the phone and not talk to your doctor and call the hospice company, get information and say, I just like somebody to come out and give me an education about what this is about. It is most, almost all the time, free care, right? It's like a non-medical home care company, but yet we are medical coming in to give extra support, especially when there is an elder most of the time, um, we, we do take care of kids in a case by case from age 12 and up, but most of the time, um, they're, you know, older and they're by themselves because their family's all over the place or there's family dynamic issues and they need the extra set of hands coming in and, you know, daily or every other day to check on them and see what their stats are and see what their mental health is about. And, um, so it can be, definitely be, you know, that support. Um, don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to pick up the phone and call Guardian Angel Hospice or whoever you would like to call. Um, and I also say, you know, um, interview a couple different companies. It's your choice. It's your, this is the big decision. Um, and, you know, just see what feels good to you. And, um, and th that is a big thing. I feel like, you know, it's the comfort piece of it's a personal decision. Um, and again, there a lot of us are out there doing a really great job. I really feel like we are really at the top of what we do um, as a privately owned organization. But I also oft truly believe that there are other organizations that also do a good job and that we all have our, our different things that we provide and offer. Well, very good. Well, I'm also cognizant of the time, and I know that you have a 12 o'clock, so yes. I want to give you a little bit of driving time to get there. So, oh, thank so you. thank you so much for coming and sharing oh, with us today. I think it was great. Is there anything else you want to get across before you, you part with us today? I just think, you know, leaving with the idea of hospice is a gift. The gift of hospice is something that you can give your loved one. It's extra support instead of looking at it as it's giving up on someone, it's actually loving someone more and making a hard decision so that, you know, they feel better, do better. Um, again, last thing I'm going to say is that we do not give up on hope. We, oh, we bring hope to the table. Um, 
And I absolutely just love what I do. And I am so honored to represent our organization and just uh, all the other people out there that do hospice with other organizations. I'm really blessed to be working with a, a bunch of wonderful, including you, Jim, um, healthcare providers. Um, it's an honor to to work with such amazing people. And you and and if speaking of the gifts, uh, Merry Christmas to to all. So, yes, yeah. Merry Christmas. Yes, Happy Holidays. Well, go have go to your appointment. I look forward Thanks. to talking to you soon. So okay, bye -bye. see you later, friend. Bye bye. bye.